This is the Brighter Web Podcast, insights on growing a small business using the latest technology and marketing best practices. I'm your co-host, Robert Carnes. Hey, and I'm your other co-host, Mickey Mellon. Good to see you, Robert. Yeah, likewise, Mickey. So yeah, so today I think we were going to talk about learning and whether learning is important for marketers and assuming that that question is yes, um, we'll kind of dig into some specifics. But to start, I think, why is learning important for marketers, continual learning? Well, digital marketing is always changing. I think, you know, we've talked about that many times on this podcast, the different uh, advances in technology. And so we have to, as marketers, adapt with it. We have to learn new platforms and new skills. And, you know, as algorithms change, we have to adapt and grow with that. And so the best way to do that is to be continual learners and to, to always go back and figure new things out. And, and uh, you're never an expert. So I think, but you can always become better. And there are people who know more than you do. And so I think the best way is just to, to learn from those people and to adapt and become more well-rounded. And I think it just fosters us to be better marketers. Yep, agreed. Yeah, expert is such a weird word to me because I think there are some experts, but depends how you slice it. But I heard it said that wisdom is what you gain after you become an expert. So if, if you're awesome at something, you think you're an expert, the more you can keep growing beyond that is really where the wisdom comes from. And it can be, yeah, continual growth is fantastic for everyone. Yeah, maybe there are experts out there, but if, if you're the person who's saying that you're the guru at something, <laughs> that's a probably flag. not. The yeah, experts correct. are the ones who who don't who just do the good work and know things and don't have to puff themselves up with it. Yes, that too, for sure. But again, and also if you think you know everything, then you're going to stop learning and therefore you no longer know everything and it falls apart real quick. That's right. So. Yep. Thus this episode. There you go. So yeah, lots of different ways you can learn. So we'll kind of tackle a few of them here. So let's start with books. I think books are something you and I both value quite a lot and read quite a lot. So yeah, tell me, tell me about learning with books. Quickly, because I think this could be a whole nother episode. We're coming up with sure. new ideas for, for future podcast episodes. But yeah, I mean, I, I love reading. It's the reason I put this as number one is because I think books are incredibly undervalued. And if you are a reader, then you're just going to naturally be sharper and be more curious and want to learn more. And so I think there's so many different books out there in marketing specifically. Uh, but just building that habit of reading regularly is going to just help you be a better, more well-rounded professional. For sure. Any specific books you think people should be making sure are on their list? Uh, there's a, a long laundry <laughs> list that we could probably put in there, but a, a few that kind of jump out initially are This Is Marketing by Seth Godin, and he's written several, so you could probably pull so from he, his He has like 22 library. books or something, so yeah, any of them are fine. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But This Is Marketing is a great place to start. Yes, for um, sure. Marketing Made Simple by Donna Muller, I think is a great one. And again, likewise, he has written quite a few that, that cover business from different perspectives, but Marketing Made Simple is a great one from a marketing standpoint. And then I'll give a, a little bit of a self plug here because uh, I just writ a book, wrote a book about marketing called The Story Cycle about how to use storytelling in marketing. So uh, I would check, encourage anybody to check out The Story Cycle as well. Yep. Awesome. And then, so what, what is reading a book though? If I listen on Audible, is that reading? Tell me your philosophy on that. I know it, big arguments both ways. I'm just curious what you think there. Sure. I'll make the debate short and simple. And I'd say, yes, audiobooks count. As long as you were learning something and absorbing something, you know, if you're playing the audiobook in the background and not listening, then no. But if you actually <laughs> right. got the content of the book, then yes, I think that counts as reading. Gotcha. And then I have another piece I do that I also count as reading. That's not necessarily where I use Blinkist to read like a 20 minute summary of a book, but then I combine that with highlights from other places and try to put together a, a picture of a book in about an hour versus reading the whole thing, which isn't always recommended, especially for the ones you talked about. They need to be read cover to cover. A lot of them do, but you can sure. also supplement and basically turn books into long form articles and just to get highlights of, of some of those that you're not super interested in, but are probably worth checking out. Blinkist or similar tools can be a good way just to, to read quote books without reading the entire book. And there's no need to split hairs as long as you're learning, as long as you're gaining something from it. That's what's important. Yep, so. absolutely. All right, how about podcasts, we say on the podcast? <laughs> well, of course, yeah. Well, if you're listening to this, obviously, then you're already on your way. You're listening to podcasts regularly. You're hopefully learning something from us. So obviously, there's a very great benefit from listening to podcasts. I think the biggest piece is the accessibility that you can listen in the car, while you're going for a walk, while you're doing the dishes, whatever. Like That's one of the reasons podcasts are so popular is the audio consumption format is just so easy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, if, you're, if you're listening, you already get that. So good for you. Yep. The, the problem I have with podcasts is that 
I need to be doing something else. I can't just sit there with my eyes closed and listen to a podcast, which is, like you said, while you're doing something else. And so for me, I had, had the flu last weekend, so I haven't been out and about this week. And so I, I normally listen a lot while I'm driving, while I'm walking around the neighborhood, while I'm exercising, while I'm working in the yard. And I've not done any of that in the last week, so I'm falling way behind in my podcasts. I'm not willing to, to do them elsewhere. But yeah, I'm excited to, to get out and do some yard work this weekend just because I know my podcast list is so backed up. It'll be a great way to catch up on those. And that is the biggest trouble is there are so many good ones to listen to. Gotcha. Yeah, for sure. So what are, what are some you would throw out that are sort of must listens? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, for this audience, when you're thinking about business and you're thinking about marketing, uh, Work Life with Adam Grant uh, yeah. is a fantastic one. He's an uh, organizational psychologist and talks a lot about culture and how we work. And I think that's a really good perspective to take. Um, Hidden Brain with Shankara Redanta, which is a Shankar daunting... Vedantam, uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Difficult one to pronounce, but yeah, it he's is. a great host and that's a great show. It uh, is. More about like psychology and the cognitive work that we do, um, emotions and that sort of thing. Uh, and then finally, I'd say another one is All It Takes is a Goal with John Acuff is the host. Um, and that's all about goal setting and productivity and how we achieve more things. And he's got some great interviews on there. So those are three quick recommendations that I would give to anybody listening. Here. And I'll toss two more on the list too, is Akimbo from Seth Godin, sure. um, which is a weekly podcast. It's been every week for years now, but it's a 15 minute riff on him on marketing, usually to some degree. And then the other one I've really been liking lately is the long and the short of it with uh, Jen Waldman and Peter Shepard. It's just the two of them. It's a 15 minute chat every couple of weeks, just about higher topics, like sort of tangentially marketing related, but more just about Let's talk about imposter syndrome this week and what that looks like and how to serve better and just, just interesting topics. And it helps that the two of them are brilliant and they're brilliant with each other. And so it makes for a fascinating, fascinating show. Awesome. So podcasts are great. Um, the next one is, is becoming more relevant again, thankfully, but conferences. Getting out to conferences, I guess, either in person or even virtually. What does that right, look like? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference with conferences is that it's an experience. You're surrounded, again, usually in person. That's mostly what I'm thinking as we're getting back yep. to those. Um, but even to a degree, virtual conferences, because they are, you know, they're big, they're loud, they're energetic. You get to be around a lot of people and sponsors, you get swag. So it's just a, it's a whole experience and usually is able to lift you up and kind of inspire you in a way, depending on what the, t you know, the topic, the theme of the conference is. But you're just, you know, you're surrounded in a, an environment of learning and networking and growing. And so that often can help kind of jumpstart you towards kind of learning something and picking up something. So uh, it, it can be expensive and difficult to travel to a conference or to buy a ticket to a conference. But uh, I think, you know, at least maybe once a year, every other year, I would encourage anybody to, to go to a big kind of learning event because of the environment that you're, you're surrounded by. Yeah, that environment is so huge because I certainly did my sh fair share of virtual conferences the last few years, and it's it's just so different. I think the big thing for me is at a real in-person conference, the best stuff I always take away is the stuff that happens between sessions where you're talking to someone else about an idea and you overhear something and just come away with some real gems in between. And in virtual conferences, frankly, I'm kind of surprised there's not yet a great solution that can facilitate that virtually, but I'm not quite sure what it would be other than VR or something that's probably coming so all the virtual conferences, I got great content from the speakers and great topics. I'm excited to get back in person and, and blow off that next session to sit and keep talking to these three people that are so fascinating <laughs> and learn, learn so much. I mean, my favorite WordCamp conference years ago, the WordPress one, is one where we deliberately said, gosh, I hate to miss that next talk, but let's just stay here in the lunchroom and keep chatting. And it was one of the best conversations of my life. It was fantastic. So yeah, I'm looking forward to being in person at some conferences. Uh, what are some conferences people should be looking at? I mentioned WordCamp is you know, the WordPress-focused one. I know they have that come in, in our area, at least in Birmingham in February, and then Atlanta, hopefully in the spring, and they're starting to come back around. But, but what else do you like? Sure. Uh, Digital Summit is a conference series that I really enjoy. They had a few virtual ones during the pandemic, but they have a series of uh, different locations uh, across the country, including Atlanta near us. Um, so I've attended that several different years. Uh, Digimarcom is one I've not been to, but heard good things about. Uh, and very similarly, they, they kind of travel and do a tour around the country where they have speakers come to a bunch of different cities, uh, I think even around globally. I think they have different locations okay. nice. uh, internationally as well. Um, and then one that's a single location every single year, usually in Boston, is Inbound, uh, which is a marketing conference put on by HubSpot. And so it's a, it's a big one. It's more expensive. It's, again, single location, but uh, I've heard really good things. And they usually have some pretty big name speakers that come to that. Awesome. So we've talked about learning via books and podcasts and conferences. I think the next one to look at is email newsletters, which 
if we had talked about this a decade ago, I'd be like, come on, email's got to be dead by then. But email's as strong as ever. And really, I think email newsletters are growing, growing faster than I would have expected. So tell me more about that. Correct. Yeah, they were out of vogue for quite a bit, uh, as, especially because spam was so rampant and it was hard to get good content from email. But as uh, you know, our filters have gotten better and as we can kind of be a little bit more personalized with what emails are showing up in our inbox, email newsletters are kind of making a comeback and a lot of people are using them well. Um, there's plenty of junk out there still, but uh, there's there's some good content that we can, can be found on a regular basis because it it's curating all the different content that's uh, popping up online. It's hard to kind of filter through those yourself, but if you can get a newsletter delivered to you once a week or once a month, they're going to filter it through it for you and deliver kind of the best of the best, the cream of the crop right to your inbox. Yeah, well said. And I certainly subscribe to my fair share of, of email newsletters. Uh, what I like that I'm seeing the trend in a lot of email newsletters is simplicity. They're going kind of going back from less flashy to just more informational and helpful and it's kind of a trend I see a lot of places. Like web design is a big one too. When someone's first learning to design on the web, they build simple, clean sites. And as they learn all the tips and tricks, they start throwing all the animations and stuff in. And then as they refine further, it becomes simple and cleaner and a, a different level of simple. And I'm seeing a lot of that with email newsletters. Um, things like the daily carnage and stuff that are, you can tell it's the, the second half of simple where it's, it's very intentional and very well done, but not overly weird graphics and stuff. It's kind of getting to the point, which personally I love. The second half of simple. That sounds like a very. That sounds like a blog post for yeah, me. There you go. I think I've covered it before, but it's been a while. I, have to, I didn't call it that either. I like. I like the wording I came up with there. So we'll have to. Okay. Unpack yeah, that. Yeah. Just wanted more. to capture that. Yeah. So you mentioned. I mean, we like to give people suggestions because there are so many newsletters out there. And you mentioned the Daily Carnage, which, um, like it sounds, is a daily marketing uh, newsletter. And I subscribed to it for a little while and enjoyed it. I had to unsubscribe because daily is far too frequently for me. And that's mm -hmm. daily one stuff. of the keys is finding a good rhythm with how many you're going to receive uh, in your inbox. Um, one that I like as well is called Total Anarchy. And it's Anne with two N's because it's from Anne Hadley. Uh, and she's a, a really good writer that I enjoy. She talks about writing and, and marketing and content. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that one. And I think she sends it monthly. So it's a little bit easier to, to digest that. Uh, and then The Hustle is another one that comes out fairly frequently. It's, it's about business and technology and leadership. Um, so it's, it's another pretty well-known one, a very big following um, with, a, with a newsletter, but they send out really good content. Yeah, and like you said, it's a matter of what you're wanting to get out of it. I like Daily Carnage too, because I open in the morning, just kind of skim through, see if anything jumps out and move on. Whereas like Ann Hadley's, it's more of a, you need to spend some time and read it, really absorb it. And having something like that every day would be way overwhelming. So it's, it's nice just to kind of figure out what works for you and kind of pick the best things. Absolutely. So our next topic we're going to talk about is mentorship. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think all of these uh, pieces that we've talked about so far are good, but they're a little bit more impersonal. You kind of have a book, but it's not going to teach you something. You have to learn from it. A conference can be impersonal because there's so many people that are going there and you're just a face in the crowd. But mentorship is really good because it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with another person who can really help shortcut uh, your experience because they theoretically have 15, 20, 30 years of experience in your field. There's somebody who you want to be in 10 to 15 to 20 years. And so you're able to go straight to the source and say, hey, what did it take for you to advance this far in your career? What kind of things should I be doing in my own you know, career path that will help me get there faster? And yeah, it's just you're able to gain experience at a much more rapid rate and a much more personalized way because you've formed a good relationship with somebody who you admire and somebody you want to be more like. So I am a real big fan of mentorship and I, I enjoy talking about why other people should, should get a mentor or should be a mentor or, or both. Yep. Cause yeah, being a mentor has advantages as well, slightly different advantages, but it certainly be a great thing to be a mentor. I think one of the big things for me in that regard is kind of the reason I blog instead of journal. I've talked about this before. If you journal, you can have your thoughts and they can just be loose. But if you blog, you have to kind of sharpen up your thinking and really package it better. And I think that's where being a mentor is. It makes you think through your experiences more and really, really unpack your own experience and, and dis dissect it down to, you know, something more valuable for someone else versus kind of having it floating out there. If you're a mentor, you have to really think about what you've done and package it and, and get clarity on your own insights and then be able to share with others. So on either side of that relationship, there's huge benefits. Yeah. I, and I think you hit on a really important point that I like to talk about too, is you can learn from either side of the table. You can learn as a mentee, obviously, but you can also learn as a mentor from, from the person you're kind of pouring into. Um, the best mentorship relationships are two-way and you can kind of mutually benefit each other 
uh, from a good mentorship relationship. Gotcha. For sure. So we've got books and podcasts and conferences and email newsletters and mentorships. I'm not going to remember the stuff I learned from all these. There's way too much stuff coming in. I'm going to forget it all next week. So how can I help make some of this information I learned stick and be beneficial? That's one of the biggest tricks is because, I mean, I think just surrounding yourself with information, surrounding yourself with a, an environment of learning is a big piece of this. But yeah, you need to actually go go do something with this and hopefully gain something from it so you're moving forward rather than just running on the treadmill of, of information. So there's a few different ways to, I think, make all this learning actually stick. Um, one is just to kind of regularly, again, surround yourself with it to make a habit of learning so that you're regularly reading books, listening to podcasts, going to conferences. Um, taking notes is another big piece. And uh, we're potentially going to do a podcast episode on that soon about how to take notes and what methods you can do and what you do with those notes once you've, you've taken them. But I think even just the process of writing things down, whether that's digitally or physically, helps you kind of internalize that information. So that's sure. a, a huge part of that. And I always make sure that I take notes wherever I go. Um, but then also to take action on that, to maybe highlight a few things that, okay, I listened to this long TED Talk or I went to this conference and I, I took five pages of notes, but here are the three things that I'm going to go back to the office and do immediately this next week. So grabbing maybe in the moment or afterwards upon reflection, a few actionable tangible items that you're going to actually put into practice quickly because that's going to help you again further internalize and further make it a habit of of those things that you're doing so just just thinking about those things and uh again taking notes and taking action on them and then like mickey you said sharing them with others actually you know blogging them or posting about this kind of stuff having conversations with others to talk about what you've learned that just further helps further re uh emphasize all the things that you've learned Yep. You know, one thing Jen Waldman has mentioned on the Long and the Short of It podcast a few times is she takes a subway to work, and so she listens to podcasts on the subway, but as soon as she gets out of the subway, she turns off the podcast and has to think now, of what I just listened to, how can I apply something from that to my day today? And so she forces herself to really think about the podcast she listened to and actually take a concrete step based on it, which, one, is fantastic in and of itself, but also makes me realize she must be super tight on what podcast she listens to. Because I've listened to a lot of podcasts that are helpful and inspirational and stuff, but I'm not going to be able to pull a, a direct lesson from each one. So you have to be very focused on what you're learning to pull that off. But it's a, a fantastic habit to put it right into use like that. Probably also means she's not listening to like a true crime podcast. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that too. There are different kind of things that you're going to learn from those podcasts. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, if you have been, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Brighter Web Podcast brought to you by Green Melon, a digital marketing agency. To help your business keep up with the latest digital marketing trends, check us out at greenmelon.com. You can also find show notes and more episodes at abriderweb.com.